My name is Alfredo Enrione. I'm a professor at ESA Business School, Universidad de los Andes in Chile. And uh, I am now a visiting scholar at the business school and the law school at Stanford University. I came here to Silicon Valley and Stanford University to learn more about this incredible ecosystem of innovation, but in particular to learn more about how uh, businesses and scholars are dealing with the key issues of society and change. In that sense, I was very surprised to find that Silicon Valley was also a place of innovation in the arts. And I was very fortunate to run into an artist that not only leads uh, this innovation, but it's also uh, very committed to uh, using art as a tool of communication and action and change in society. Uh, Mike. Uh, oh, thank you. How are you today? Nice to see you. Uh, why don't you tell us a little more about uh, this particular piece? The name of this painting is Don Quixote meets ocean change. And the reason I made it is because w there's a tremendous amount of attention given to the impact of carbon dioxide on the climate and not enough attention given to the interest of the impact of carbon dioxide on the ocean. And so I made this painting to help bring attention to the threat that carbon dioxide has on the oceans of the United States, the fishing industry, the processing industry, and other oceans around the world. Let, let, let me ask you a few questions. Sure. First, uh, when, when you think of art, and you think of you know, the mecca of art, you think of New York. Yeah. Uh, uh, why do you think uh, this is happening in the Silicon Valley? You know, what's happening is messages are being interpreted on canvas to help the scientists, the academics, share important messages with decision makers worldwide. It's happening in Silicon Valley because, let's say, in my particular case, I wanted to paint or I, before I even thought about this, this, by the way, is carbon dioxide rising out of its birthplace and jumping into the ocean to destroy all the species in the oceans that have shells and, and skeletons. It is easy for me to grasp the concepts of what's happening in the environment mm -hmm. with the gases, etc., because in this valley, there is NASA, there is the United States Geological Survey, there is the Stanford, there is the Woods Institute on the Environment. At Stanford, there's the Precourt Energy Efficiency Center. This place is loaded with people who are studying the threat that carbon dioxide has on the climate, on the ocean, on you and me, it's easy for me to get the insights of what's going on. And then that leads to the imagery that allows me to tell some of the stories that are, are important today. Uh, I understand this is your third piece uh, uh, depicting Don Quixote. Yeah. Uh, why, why Don Quixote? Do you feel like Quixote uh, <laughs> while trying to deliver this message? You know, I'm about to give a, a speech at the United States Geological Survey, which is part of the United States Department of Interior. And I've already received emails saying, wait a second, Michael, ocean change is a serious topic, and so is climate change a serious topic. Don Quixote, how can you bring a, a book, a man that's 400 years old, a man who, who had a wild personality. Yes, he set out to fight the greatest challenges of the world, and he had this tremendous spirit. But also, he, you know, he imagined giants were windmills. Now, why do I connect something from the humanities, like Don Quixote, with something real? It has a lot to do with the fact that he is a great 
icon. He will bring attention to this painting and these concepts. The scientists at NASA everywhere, they're crying. They understand where the impact of carbon emissions is taking this country and the rest of the world. And the people in Congress and in other parts of the world in this country are not listening to them. I painted three paintings with Don Quixote because I know it's going to get the attention of the Latino and Hispanic voters in this country and many other voters. It's going to bring them in to this painting. It's going to give the scientists, the academic, another opportunity to share their good, important messages. Uh, could you explain a little more on, on, on the painting? Uh, Don Quixote has his spear. Yes. Uh, what is you know, dragging uh, back the spear okay. uh, of Don Quixote? Well, I, I think of it, let me go like, let me come over here. Um, I think it's important to bring attention to where carbon dioxide is born. And it's born in these smoke stacks, you know. And, and if you look in this, you have pictures of Congress in it, in these smoke stacks, because they are complacent in allowing this carbon dioxide monster to come out and attack and, and threaten the entire United States commercial fishing industry and all the jobs and money, etc. And so what that allows me to do then is to show what is going to happen to those industries and the people, the voters, the fishermen, and the other folks that are depending on that industry. And now we have Don Quixote back here. And he was willing to march into hell for a noble cause. He was willing to grab a big lance and try to stop this threat at the birthplace of greenhouse gases. And he is trying to do that. And here's you and me and other folks. We are trying to help him do it. We are regular people of this nation. But look what is attached to it. There is this anchor. And it is the United States Congress. And it is the United States Congress, which is the most important organization in the world that can do something to stop the threat of greenhouse gases. But they are an anchor. They are keeping Don Quixote and the rest of the Americans from going and doing something significant to stop greenhouse gases. I made this painting to help voters realize they have got to vote the people out of Congress who refuse to act and stop greenhouse gas emissions before they make this country and the rest of the world very unpleasant or actually lead to the demise of the planet. What, what, what do you expect to happen with your painting? Uh, what effect do you want to create? Well, a couple. Well, first of all, because of this particular area with NASA, Stanford, the US Geological Survey, and some other organizations, they will show this painting at their important event. For example, the first organization that will debut this painting is the USGS, United States Geological. And Stanford has already booked it for June of 2015 to display it at their annual energy summit. And so has uh, uh, Sustainable Silicon Valley has also booked this painting to display it. These organizations display it at their, at their events. People come in, they ask questions, and, and then I get an opportunity often on the stage or right next to the painting to help explain the painting. And those who under who've been exposed to this painting also help raise the level of discussion of what is happening and hopefully it leads to people thinking about how can we do something about Congress so that the full force of the United States can go to work and stop the greenhouse gas emissions sooner than later. Hmm. Have you considered uh, 
uh, portraying your paintings uh, at younger age? Because, you know, maybe uh, we're trying to convert which the, the people that it's already converted or those that do not want to listen. How about, you know, uh, children in schools? Because well, this is a very strong yeah. image. Yeah. Uh, a couple of points. Well, the Don Quixote is to bring new communities to the message. Secondly, um, I tend to make paintings that, that are sophisticated and, and hard to understand, but bring people in because they recognize it's about something important. So I have this tendency to go at, at the big decision makers, people who have a lot of power, and not all of them by any means recognize this threat. But then, in a little while, we are going to sit down, you and I, with a nine-year-old student from Silicon Valley, and she is going to ask questions of me, but also of you, related to this painting. And that segment will be used to help reach her schoolmates and, and other persons that... Let, 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 let me ask a question that at, at least is very important for me. Uh, here you have the voters, you have Congress, you have the monster. Uh, where do you see uh, the corporate world in your picture, or, or at least in the history you're trying to tell in the picture? Well, I think the corporate world right now is uh, pretty much hung up on sustainability. They're, they're trying to have apply sustainability to everything, including the materials they use and the energy that they use. And to some extent, they are trying to prepare for the hits. They have a sense that the storms are coming soon and it's going to disrupt their distribution channels, it's going to disrupt their markets. So they, they also hear and uh, acting on the zeitgeist of resilience. Sustainability and resilience is where corporate America is right now. I predict that next year or the year after, top level executives in the corporations around the U.S. are going to realize that sustainability and resilience in the light of constantly increasing greenhouse gases and constantly are going to be passe concepts, passe. It's, they're defensive. The thinking is going to be to move that they and the rest of the country and the world is going to have to be more aggressive with respect to greenhouse gases. It is going to be a recognition that there is already too much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, too much greenhouse gases in the ocean that is healthy and safe for the United States. They're going to start thinking about how do they decarbon help decarbonize the nation, the world, their business. That's the so I think we're going to see an evolution of corporations to becoming more aggressive because they know their markets are going to be disrupted and their profits are going to be disrupted. What, what, what kind of reactions do you get from business leaders when they see your work? Well, I would say it's an extremely good one. There, there is something about my work, and I think Cole Wilbur, who was the president and first president of the Lucy and David Packard Foundation. He saw one of my paintings and he came up to me and he says, Michael, it's important. You know when you look at it, there is an important message here. It pulls you in and you want to know more about it and you are changed. That's very much the reaction I get from uh, um, policy makers, presidents, etc. They see my work, they feel it is important, they want to know more about it, and sometimes they invite me to give speeches at their events to help raise the level of discussion of usually the concept of sustainability and resilience, and to help bring their audiences forward a bit. And uh, here you, you're basically uh, describing the destruction of an industry, a way of living. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do, do you expect a reaction from, from that particular industry? Yes. I think the lobbying organizations, the associations that represent the fishing, commercial fishing industry, then the commercial seafood industries, those folks, are, as we go forward, will get the message that carbon dioxide is going to destroy 
their members' livelihood. It's got to happen. You know, it's just going to take a little while. But they are going to start hearing the message. They're going to start researching it, checking with other folks. And then they're going to tell their members, hey, look, you've got to look at who's going, you're voting for, for Congress, for the Senate. And you've got to organize and you've got to put your money and your vote behind those persons when they get back in Congress before the right after the 2016 election, they got to vote for a president who is going to work to stop greenhouse gases, and they got to vote for senators and members of the House of Representatives that uh, are going to get rid of greenhouse gases as soon as possible. Well, this is fascinating. Uh, okay. Well, this is Alfredo Enrione. Thank you very much. I was wondering, shall we sit and let's invite our, uh, our journalist on and we'll take some more questions. We take Absolutely. the middle seat. Very good. Very good. Thank you. You make life easy for me. Hi. I was, uh, Hi, thank Sarah. you. Hello. And would you be kind to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Isabella and I go to school and I go to school in a Menlo Park school and um, my assignment for journalism was to do an interview on someone, and I'm going to do an interview on you guys. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm honored, and I, I just want to say, I know I asked you once, at this time in your life, what do you think you would want to be when you got older? And you said you thought you might like to be a journalist. And I've also known you've worked on some books already and that you are a real serious nine-year-old. So I am delighted if you'd ask me some questions. And Alfredo, I think, may also help me answer them. Um, how long did it take you to paint the painting? Well, I want to say for about six or seven weeks, I thought about the painting. I knew. I wanted to take greenhouse gases, one of them at least, and paint it as a man-beast monster. So, because I think people identify with a monster. But I thought and thought mostly about the composition, the composition, how everything is laid out. And I wanted to focus on the ocean and, and it, greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide threat to the fish and the crabs, etc. It took me a long while to think about, well, if I have the, it come, uh, the gases coming out, make it into a man, and then go down, and then it, they could go up with, you know, that fish. Once I had that idea, you know, I, I could see the wave of the painting, the viewer's mind, you know, going like this and this and this. As soon as I saw I could do that, it then took about another two months. And uh, so it, it was about six or seven weeks of thinking, but I was doing many, many other things at the same time. Good question. Um, why did you paint um, greenhouse gases as a monster? I did it because I feel that we relate to monsters. I mean, maybe I even get nightmares. Or when I know when I was younger, I had nightmares. And we know what monsters are. They are threatening, right? And I think more decision makers, leaders in the United States and other places, have to start thinking about carbon dioxide as a monster, as a threat to us. And so that's why I made it into a monster. And I'm going to paint another monster soon, too, another one of them. Um, what is the meaning of the painting? Like, what is the true, mes the true message that you're trying to? Well, I, this is very sophisticated now. I see thousands, millions of people around the world. Let's just say the United States. They all talk about the importance of the environment, and they talk about the threat of climate change. 
but then when they go to select the people who they're going to send to Congress to run this country, they forget. They tend not to vote for the people who say, I am going to protect the environment, as well as business. You can do both. And I am going to vote for people who are going to stop greenhouse gases. They just don't vote. And it's the vote that matters most, not just saying, I want to see progress or I want to see. It's the vote that matters most. And so I made this painting to try to help more voters recognize that they, especially those in the fishing industries and related industry, that they're going to lose their jobs soon if they don't get people in Washington, including a president, who will say, we have to stop carbon dioxide emissions now. Another question? Um, why did you paint about greenhouse gases? Hmm? Why did you paint about greenhouse gases? Well, I think it's more important to, th there's not enough of focus in this world on the threat. You know, we hear climate change, and who knows what that really means at some point. I think we need to see the real threat. Okay. Um, what are you planning on painting next? I'm going to paint, make a painting where I tap into songwriting. Stephen Sondheim's Send in the Clowns. And I'm going to show carbon dioxide reaching down into the earth under the sea and opening up the cage where another gas, terrible gas, methane, is in. And it's going to start letting this second gas, second monster, loose. That's going to be the next one. And since the name of it is Send in the Clowns, you have the job of painting the clowns. I think we have two more questions. Can I have two more from you? Um, yeah. Um, what was your favorite part to paint? My favorite part to paint? Well, uh, I got a kick out of painting the Washington as an anchor. I got that very much. I, I also enjoyed a bit of the monster. But I am personally not very good at painting the figures and people. and that's, that's not my thing. I mostly enjoy finding a way to move the eye and the mind and back all around the painting. That's what I like doing. One more? Um, that's all. Isabella, you have been great. I would like to ask the professor a couple of questions. Now, I've learned you're a visiting professor from a university in Ch Chile. Yes. And you're at Stanford, and you're working as a scholar as, uh, in the Graduate School of Business, which is pretty high up in, in, in Stanford's. Uh, and, and it's social capital is your area. Yes. Uh, well, uh, actually, social capital has been uh, a discovery. I, w I, I was looking for something that uh, would help me in answering uh, some questions in my research. Um, the thing is that you know corporations are are a rather recent invention in history, uh, you know, a couple of hundred years. But just in two hundred years, they they have become the dominant way that society solves most of its needs, you know, shelter, health, food, transportation, etc. If you take the 100 top economies in the world, more than half are, are corporations. So th the thing that I'm concerned is uh, how corporations uh, can act and have a positive effect in society. So I run into social capital as a lens uh, to look at corporations and a relationship with uh, society. OK, so let me paraphrase a bit. You see that. The social fabric of countries like uh, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, on and on and on, and the United States, and the United States, Absolutely. are being torn apart and, and weakened. And you see corporations as now this tremendous force in the world. And 
you're trying to figure a way of how to help the corporations recognize the importance that they must of, of keeping this fabric and pulling this fabric of social together because they are going to suffer. You know, they're going to lose their markets, their profits, etc. if this social fabric that holds us all together and it's so important isn't addressed. Is, would that be what you're up to? Oh, you, you, you made a great synthesis of, of, of what I'm trying to do. Well, I listen uh, to you. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, if, if you use trust as a proxy of social capital, uh, and you look at this indicator of trust over the world, and in the United States, uh, certainly, uh, over the last 30 years, trust has been falling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the, you know, your painting meant to address uh, voters. Uh, the, the, the degree of citizen participation, you know, in community activities, including voting, uh, in the world and in the United States, it's falling. And, and, and I think that corporations, as probably the largest power in the world should try to help yes. in, in rebuilding this fabric. Yes. It's not only governments. Okay. Now you have a big event coming up. Uh, we have only about a minute left in 2016 in yes. Chile and, and w with the International Academy of Management. What's, yes. Briefly, what's that about? Uh, well, uh, the International Academy of Management is a group of uh, CEOs from uh, a number of Fortune 500 companies and uh, a group of uh, senior professors uh, from the top universities in the world. And we're going to meet in Chile uh, in January 5th of 2016 uh, to discuss some of these issues uh, and what could uh, corporations and universities be doing uh, in, in dealing with this uh, very important matter. Would you keep me, um, keep me up to date on what's happening? And would you say good night? to the audience, goodbye to you, and tell them who you are again, and uh, thank them for Isabella and myself. Would you be kind? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and to you. Uh, I'm Alfredo Enrione, a visiting professor at Stanford University from Chile, and it has been a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.